Before I read the scripture, let me give you a, a brief update on me. Uh, after I left uh, First Parish, I served as the interim pastor at Middleton Congregational Church, and we were able to provide them with a good pastor, even though he is a retired Marine. Um, that's a little inter-service rivalry there. And, uh, <laughs> and then I, uh, I am now serving as the 4C area pastor for Northeast Massachusetts. Years ago, Kevin Burkett, some of you may know Kevin, uh, or Steve Burkett, excuse me. Steve Burkett was the area pastor, or we sometimes called it area representative for the North Shore. Well, it got so big that we had to divide it in two. So your area pastor is Reverend Nick Granitzis, who was the pastor at First Congregational Revere for like 35 years. And our Northeast Regional Minister, Terry Shanahan, some of you will remember him, He's getting ready to retire, and he will be replaced by Paul McFeeders, who was the pastor of Forestdale Community Church in Malden. That's, that's hard to keep all that together, but uh, though that's all the new. All, that's all the news, and uh, I've been assist. I, my my job is to assist, encourage, coach, and oversee uh, ministers and churches. Uh, in the northern area, sort of like Haverhill and Newburyport and uh, uh, places like that. So, keeps me busy. Okay, now for the rest of the story. You heard the first part of the chapter. Now we're going to look at verses uh, 21 to 32. The, the king sent Yehudi to get the scroll. Yehudi brought it from Elishama's room and read it to the king as all his officials stood by. It was late autumn, and the king was in a winterized part of the palace, sitting in front of a fire to keep warm. Each time Yehudi finished reading three or four columns, the king took a knife and cut off that section of the scroll. He then threw it into the fire, section by section, until the whole scroll was burned up. Neither the king nor his attendants showed any fear or signs of repentance at what they had heard. Even when Elnathan, Deliah, and Gamaria begged the king not to burn the scroll, he wouldn't listen. Then the king commanded his son Jeremiel, Sariah, son of Azrael, and Shlemiah, son of Abdeel, to arrest Baruch and Jeremiah, but the Lord had hidden them. After the king had burned the scroll on which Baruch had written Jeremiah's words, the Lord gave Jeremiah another message. He said, get another scroll and write everything again, just as you did on the scroll Je Jehoiakim burned. Then say to the king, this is what the Lord says. You burned the scroll because it said the king of Babylon would destroy this land and empty it of people and animals. Now, this is what the Lord says about the king Jehoiakim of Judah. He will have no heirs to sit on the throne of David. His dead body will be thrown out to lie unburied, exposed to the heat of the day and of the frost of the night. I will punish him and his family and his attendants, for their sins, I will pour out on them and on all the people of Jerusalem and Judah all of the disasters I promised, for they would not listen to my warnings. So Jeremiah took another scroll and dictated again to his secretary, Baruch. He wrote everything that had been on the scroll King Jehoiakim had burned in the fire. Only this time he added much more. The word of the Lord. I'm going to sing a song now about union with Christ.
Spirit of heaven, flood over me. Forming Christ in all that I do. Turn every sinful desire in me into holy passion for you. Oh, Spirit of God, come down. Let mercy and grace abound. My passionate prayer shall be Christ in me. Spirit of beauty and holiness, come refine with fire from above till I am cast in your righteousness and I love the things that you love oh spirit of God come down let mercy and grace abound my passionate prayer shall forgiveness when darkness falls and my heart is heavy with sin filled me with faith for the higher cause of the ceaseless praise of the King oh Spirit of God come down let mercy and grace abound my passionate prayer shall be Christ in me If you were shipwrecked on a desert island, what book would you most like to have? Maybe Shipbuilding for Beginners. But to survive the storms of life, we need God's revelation. Karl Barth said, we must read the Bible through the eyes of of shipwrecked people for whom everything has gone overboard. The Bible was not given to make us feel good, but to make us good. We read it for reformation. God gave the prophet Jeremiah a message. It wasn't a soothing word, but a sober warning of judgment and a call for national repentance. When we sin, where we repair or we repeat. And so we find both good and bad news in the Bible. God gives us commandments and he expects us to keep them. Scripture is serious about sin. It doesn't make light of our wrongdoings. And yet, the promises of pardon are on nearly every page. In Jeremiah 26, God tells the prophet not to diminish a single word of the divine message, even though it may seem pretty harsh. Jeremiah might be tempted to tone down the harsh rhetoric. You know, being prophetic isn't only foretelling, but forth 
truth-telling, issuing rebuke, telling people things they'd rather not hear, exposing their sin. And so my advice for you is, don't become a prophet if you have a need to be liked. Jeremiah had been faithfully preaching for 22 frustrating years. One thing I know is a lot of ministers are frustrated, particularly with COVID, particularly because a lot of the people aren't coming back. And, and they wonder, all that preaching I did, all that encouragement, all the visits I made, was it worth it? Well, this, Jeremiah felt that way. He was, And you know, Obviously, his message was not pleasing to his audience, and he, hadn't, he wasn't successful. He was unable to persuade Israel to return to the Lord. And we see here in verse 5 that he was even barred from the temple. And so he sent his scribe to publicly read his message. The people resented Jeremiah's concern for them. But you know, Jeremiah wasn't one of these angry prophets like Jonah. His warnings were given with tearful compassion. But nonetheless, his concerns were interpreted as condemnations. Some of you might know that Jeremiah is often called the weeping prophet. In the very same way, Jesus wept over Jerusalem and their rejection of the way, truth, and life. Non-believers try to suppress the knowledge of God by inventing all sorts of objections and alternative explanations for why the world exists. I think most of the people who reject God know very little about what they're rejecting. They claim to be agnostic, but in reality, I think a lot of them are simply apathetic. They're spiritually blind and deaf by their own doing. I wonder, how do we respond when we see people headed on the wrong path? One that can only lead to misery and destruction. Do we care enough to confront them? It would be heartless to ignore their harmful behavior without warning them. But we do so lovingly. The goal of correction is to help, not to hurt. And yet, the sad truth is we can't fix people's problems. Ultimately, it's their responsibility. We can only encourage them to accept God's solutions. We can't prevent the consequences of their choices. And in the end, we need to let people have whatever kind of life they choose. After giving advice, we accept that they may choose to reject our views and values. Well, so Jeremiah gave correction, but his intent was to heal. His appraisal wasn't just his opinion. It came from above. Scripture is like a mirror, and we may not like what we see when we look in it. Uh, there was a guy, one of our veterans in Sagas, and at the Veterans Council, they said that he doesn't want any visitors, he's not well, and he does, he's kind of upset about his appearance. And most of the guys in the Veterans Council are around my age, and I said, well, most of us don't like our appearance either. Scripture, though, has a way of showing us what we really do look like. Mark Twain said, it's not the things I don't understand about the Bible that disturb me, it's the things I do know that trouble me. The Bible tells us exactly who we are. It's, it's also like a health checkup. Do you like going to the doctor? A lot of people just refuse to do it. Sometimes the doctor's diagnosis is very unwelcome news. We're told what's wrong and we may resist the treatment. What does he know? Some people never go to the doctor. A friend of mine who died much younger than he should have, I found out later he never went to see the doctor. 
Well, all of us are sick. And the disease we all suffer from is sin. And the great physician is ready to heal us. So we read that Jeremiah took a scroll and he wrote on it God's assessment of Israel. God breathed into these words his power. The prophet's message was charged by God's spirit and became a double-edged sword, piercing facades, uncovering hypocrisy, pride, and unholy desires. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just don't want to watch the news. It seems like every day we're hearing about senseless murders committed by people with no moral restraint or of unjust wars. Christians get dismayed, but not surprised by violence. I am dismayed by what Bethany has said, but I'm not surprised. We live in a fallen world, a world that is broken and in need of redemption. And due to the fall, people do whatever they please, whatever is right in their own eyes. And without a moral compass, a sense of right and wrong, anyone can justify anything. Jeremiah's uncompromising message was not just doom and gloom. It also was about how to avoid the dire consequences of sin. Verse 3, Perhaps when the people of Judah hear about every disaster I plan to inflict on them, each of them will turn from their wickedness and sin. They might repent. Repentance is a resolve to walk in a new direction, to pick ourselves up and to start anew. However, Tim Keller cautions, when we repent out of fear of consequences, we are not really sorry for the sin, but for ourselves. We should seek change because we care about what God thinks about our sin and what it's doing to us. We're, we're sick of how our choices have ruined our lives. One of my favorite authors, Madeline Langle, writes, Repentance is neither easy nor cheap. It hurts. It costs us all our pride and self-will. It means letting go completely and handing ourselves back to God. If we reject the Bible as our moral authority, we're apt to become our own gods and make our own truth, our own rules. And that is is moral relativism. If truth is relative, then there is no truth and nothing is true. If life is an accident, and if there is no God, then there are no absolutes, no right or wrong. All we're left with are personal arbitrary preferences. And anything goes. The public reading of Jeremiah's message produced a storm that swept into the palace. Jehoiakim, the king of Israel, was not pleased with God's cutting words. So he seized the offending manuscript, cut it into pieces, and tossed it into the fire. No fear of God, no sorrow over sin, only contempt. In verses 29 to 30, this self-important ruler paid the price for his indifference. R.C. Sproul stated, You don't have to give up your intellect to trust the Bible. You only have to give up your pride. We may reject God, but he can overrule us. It is a fearful thing to reject the life-giving word of God. To accept means to follow. We only believe the parts of the Bible that we do. So does the Bible's teaching make a difference in how we live? The Bible is light for the soul, but whoever rejects it remains stuck in spiritual darkness. 
Bibles can be burned pretty easily, but God's word cannot be destroyed. Isaiah declared, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And the Apostle Paul wrote in a Roman prison, God's word is not chained. The truth cannot be suppressed. Jeremiah and his scribe put together a second draft, adding to the original message, verse 32. This is the most detailed account we have of the writing of any part of Scripture. And so now a revised version, new and improved, was circulating through the streets of Jerusalem. Over the centuries, people have tried to destroy God's word. There have been many Jehoiakims. In the 1500s, William Tyndale translated the Bible into English using simple, everyday words to make the text clear to the average reader. The result was a Bible both readable and accurate. But the Bishop of London was so enraged by this that he purchased scores of copies of Tyndale's Bible, which he then had publicly burned. What he didn't know was that the money he used to buy these Bibles helped to finance Tyndale's revised second edition. And when the printers were later questioned as to who financed this printing, they answered, it was the bishop. Psalm 2 cries out, why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain. No one can hinder the plan and purpose of God. Jehoiakim thought that he had put an end to Jeremiah's prophecy, but the message endured. And Jeremiah withstood significant abuse without becoming bitter. God has given us the Bible to inform, transform, and to give us a countercultural uh, consciousness. The book that Jeremiah wrote is not merely a boat building kind of book, it is a book about survival. The prophet Jeremiah explains how a life is constructed that gets us where we ought to go. He gives hope to shipwrecked souls, showing us the way back to God. Let's pray. Healer of our souls, we get stranded by sin when we disregard your truth. Lord, rescue us with your word and persuade us to guide our lives by your direction. May we turn our hearts to you and rely upon your word to bring healing and wholeness to our lives. You have the words of everlasting life. In your thrice holy name we pray. Amen.